next topic is uh, mems micro electro mechanical systems micro electro mechanical systems so name itself uh, giving information about the device it should be small because it is in uh, its size should be very very small it should be in micros and the electro mechanical combination of electronics electrical systems and mechanical systems combination of electronics electrical systems and mechanical systems so if we combine these devices and if the size of the device is very small then we can we can call that sensor as mems or that measuring device as mems so micro machining here we have constructional details how to construct a mems here we have bulk micro machining it is now well known that there are differences in h rates students here h means the process of manufacturing mems etch h means the process of manufacturing of mems differences in h rates between the crystallographic directions of silicon with particular hns hns means the substitutes the substance which we are using to construct mems the components the materials which we are going to use in construction of mems manufacturing of mems particular hns and using this property features can be fabricated in particular crystal planes generally triple one planes h is lowest of all Hundred oriented substrates are preferred for features. Triple one planes. So different kinds of uh, platforms we can use to construct mems, and more than hundred oriented substrates are preferred for features. The substrate is masked by. silicon dioxide so2 when ethylene diamine pyro catechol is used as hn some material names here we are mentioning which we are using in construction of mems and silicon nitrate is used for koh as the hn koh has a hn koh means potassium hydroxide potassium hydroxide surface micro machining differences between differences between the h properties differences between the h properties of polysilicon and sio2 differences between h properties of polysilicon and sio2 are used for features development the process based on cmos technology already we have seen uh, what is transistor what is diode and what is the mosfets in the first year itself so here we are using cmos technology polysilicon layer is deposited on top of uh, silicon dioxide and then etched the thickness of the deposited layer is similar is limited to a few microns only already we have seen the size should be very very small the size should be very very small the name 
sacrificial layer is often used as it is ultimately not of any use in the design except its application in growing or properly etching other layers. A process known as LIGA from the words lithographic galvano farming and farming is an alternative the process of micro machining it uses lithographic exposure of thick photoresist and then electroplating is carried out for building mechanical parts i will show you a video uh, in this uh, lecture students uh, then you can easily understand the terms of uh, photoresistance and uh, uh, electro electroplating for the mechanical parts it uses the lithographic exposure of thick photoresist and then electroplating is carried out for building mechanical parts this process fabricates thicker structures than that by surface micro machine the exposure source in liga is the synchrotron radiation of wavelength between 0.1 and 2 nanometers that can penetrate deep down to about 500 micrometers lasers and uv sources have also been used when the penetration depths are limited to 200 micrometers and 20 micrometers respectively so these are the constructional details how to construct mems and what are the devices we are going what are the materials we are using in this construction of mems construction means etching and what are the sizes in different uh, steps in the construction of mems one more method is there a process comparatively newer in development is based on bonded silicon on insulator bonded on insulator where silicon wafer is thermally bonded to an oxidized silicon the bonded wafer is polished to the desired thickness between 5 micrometers and 200 micrometers and the etching is done by deep reactive ion and deep reactive ion etching is called as dri the dri technique uses an inductively coupled plasma etcher with special etching techniques to achieve high etch rates in this process anisotropy in the material is used to form very deep features with the vertical side walls so here you can see students four types of uh, methods are represented in figures <coughs> process a through d as discussed here however requires surface uh, patterning process a through d as discussed here however requires surface patterning as a result the structure produce a turn out to be quasi three dimensional as a result the structure produced turn out to be quasi three dimensional complete three dimensional microstructures can be produced in poly in both poly silicon and bsoi process by rotating the surface micro machine parts 
out of the plane of the wafer and latching them into position required for the design. So students, now I will show you one now video. So manufacturing or etching of a sensor, then uh, we can understand the different uh, steps in uh, etching of MEMS. Friend, uh, here we have, friends, here we have a demo video, the photo etching process.
Sir, yes, students. Sir, audio is not audible yeah, yeah, and I, I, yeah, it's I'm likely lagging, sir. I will try to play audio, students. Students, uh, any triply students are attending here? Hello? Yes, sir. Triply? Yes, sir. Hey, Peru, Mani, Peru? Snee, yes, sir. Snee, you have WhatsApp lo message forward out? No, yes, sir. Like, it's a late time, sir. That's the problem. Who is the CR? No, no, sir. Do you have a VAMC member of the CR? Late, sir. Up to first meeting, low name martyred among the Wamshi martyred and Matami thirty. So, up to the number one group at just no, okay, sir. Then only CRs to a group frame Jesse Danta Berthan. Aim, sir. Wamshi Unna Parvalet, sir. Like my Muthi six members at triply low. So, we have no okay. problem once you being part of it. Okay, then okay, right. okay, sir. thank you, sir. Students, about this video, I tried to play audio, but it is not coming. So I will minimize the speed uh, by seeing that uh, subtitles, you can understand the step-by-step -step process. So I will uh, play once again this video. It is a just demo video to understand the process of etching.
to remain, while the rest of the sheet has exposed metal where the material is to be removed. The next step is to have the sheet put through an etching machine, where etchant is sprayed on both sides of the sheet. Where the etchant comes in contact with exposed material, the metal is dissolved. Where the resist has been applied, the material will be protected from the etchant. When the sheet is finished etching, Tyler's or integrated circuits. How are they made? Greek words. Photo meaning light, litho meaning stone, and graphy meaning writing. Photo. So this is about the etching process in uh, MEMS students. MEMS and microsensors. Microsensors are two and three dimensional micro machine structures that have smaller size, improved performance, better reliability, and lower production cost than many alternative forms of sensor. They are part of the wider class of micro electromechanical systems devices that also includes micro actuators. Students actuator means it is a device which has a solenoid rod and by taking the by, by receiving the input, the, it can move solenoid rail front and back or top and bottom. Most of the application is that only act, about actuator. Typical sizes of micro sensors ranges from 10 micrometers up to 5 mm. The defining feature of any MEMS device is an element with some sort of mechanical functionality integrated with micro electronics. Micro sensors can be regarded as miniature transducers since they convert energy in the form of a measured mechanical signal into energy in electrical form. So this is about uh, MEMS and microsensor students. Go through this slide. Next, we'll uh, discuss remaining uh, points.
individual devices vary from simple ones where the mechanical part does not move to much more complex ones involving several moving elements so generally the size will be very very less in the mems so all the parameters will come near to the ic and then ic will receive those uh, parameter values internally if necessary we have to move mechanical devices currently devices to measure temperature pressure all these are physical parameter uh, physical parameters these many parameters we have and biological parameters are there biomedical parameters are there so students uh, so a few points uh, i have missed in the previous slides about thin film and thick film and mems so again i have added these points to understand the thin film and thick film technologies a thin film is a layer of material <coughs> ranging from fractions of nanometers to several micrometers in thickness the controlled synthesis of materials as thin films is a fundamental step in many applications the household mirror which typically has a thin metal coating on the back of a sheet of glass to form a reflective interface the process of silvering was once commonly used to produce mirrors while more recently metal layer is deposited using technique such as sputtering thick film technology is used to produce electronic devices modules such as surface mount devices modules hybrid integrated circuits heating elements integrated passive devices and sensors main manufacturing technique is screen printing which is addition to use manufacturing electronic devices can also be used for various graphic uh, reproduction targets so students so these are constructional details and how to frame thin film thin film sensors is the point in this slide so i will uh, show you few few pics to understand the process of uh, thin film and thick film technology so we have to study all these points to understand the uh, constructional process of uh, thick film and thin film technology
students in this uh, video we can uh, see the process of uh, sputtering successful in depositing a clear conductive layer on students is audio coming onto a microscope slide so this will be the basis for a lot of my future experiments students uh, is audio and other display technologies coming for so, this video sure. yes sir yes sir. Yeah. Yes, tell me. Yes, sir. Audio is coming, sir. Audio is coming, sir. The device that's actually doing the depositing is called a sputter gun. And I machined mine from uh, basic pieces of metal. And I'm going to unscrew it here like this. And eventually the whole thing just comes off like so. And down in the hole here is a spark plug, and it's facing up towards us. So on the underside, uh, there's the rest of the spark plug, of course. And then right next to it, there's a needle valve with a hose coming off, and the hose runs to my argon cylinder. So I can control how much argon is getting into the chamber through the needle valve, and I can get high voltage into the chamber through the spark plug. And the underside of the uh, spotter gun has a, a rod in here that contacts the top of the spark plug, so I have sort of a shielded entry into the chamber. The sputter gun itself is relatively simple in construction, so let me just take it apart and show it's inside and then describe how the whole process works. So the very outside is uh, called a ground shield, and it slides off like this. And the purpose of this is just to keep the, um, the things that you don't want to sputter inside this. So when the shield is on, the only thing that's exposed to the chamber is the surface of this disc here, which is the thing that we want to sputter to um, send off onto the microscope slide. So if we take that off, the rest of it is built like this, and between these two layers is an insulator. So we'll take this apart, and currently there's um, some changes that I'm going to make to this. Uh, these are nylon screws and nuts holding it all together and nylon is not really a, a great vacuum chamber material so eventually i'm going to upgrade this i'm not quite sure what i'm going to use instead and so this part is at the um, vacuum chamber case potential let's just call that ground and then the inner part here this is where it touches the spark plug this is all at a negative high voltage let's say a thousand volts negative so inside here, um, we've got a, a very high potential between this outer shell and the inner shell, but there's a few other tricks here that um, allow us to sputter just the target material and not sputter the rest of it. So I'll open this up. And as you can see, I'm missing quite a few screws because I have a steel magnet is inserted, um, one that I cracked where the... Uh, disc has been eroded by the sputtering. I've also got some holes in here for a cooling system, which <laughs> unfortunately I didn't have running yet, so that's uh, hence the uh, cracked disc. And the idea with that would be called this, an o-ring in the right spot here. This whole thing closes up systems that ran for, you know, eight hours a day. I figured that the thermal mass of this block would be enough to keep me safe for, a, you know, a five-minute run. But um, as it turns out, not quite. Um, I'm not sure if this was due to my clamping or you know, too much power or something, but I think water cooling is kind of a necessary thing if you want to sputter stuff at any reasonable rate. So if you want to make a nice uniform coating on something, say like a microscope slide, you have a few different options. And two of the most common ones are evaporation and sputtering. So in a previous video, I described the evaporation process. In coming slides, we will see what is evap evaporation in theoretical students, but here just uh, understand the process. And this entails uh, heating up the material that you want to coat. Sorry, heating up the material with which you want to make the coating. And typically that's done in a metal boat like this. So what we do is pass a really high current through here. This thing becomes very, very hot, uh, white hot even, yellow hot. And the material here evaporates and then condenses on the thing that you want to coat. So this is, you know, roughly analogous to boiling water in the kitchen and then noticing water droplets condense on a cold window. 
Um, the downside with this is that you have to heat up the material to that yellow hot temperature. So if your material can't take it for whatever reason, or if it changes into another material at that temperature, then this isn't going to work. And when we're talking about making conductive ITO coatings, uh, this is definitely the case, where if you heat ITO up in a vacuum, um, as far as I know, it reduces itself back down to uh, base metals, and it, it doesn't work. So an alternative process is called sputtering. And this works by accelerating gas molecules and slamming the gas molecules at very high speed into the surface of the material with which we want to make the coating. And when that happens, at just the right energy levels, um, it actually chips off a few molecules of the surface, off the surface of this material, and they go spraying off into the chamber. And eventually they'll land on uh, the thing that you want to coat. So here's a cross-section view of the sputter gun. The ITO disc is the thing with which we want to make the coating. And then we've got our magnetic pole piece here with north and south poles. It doesn't matter which is which, I don't think. Um, the idea with the pole piece being that the magnetic flux goes through the, the steel and then back up, you know, through here. So the magnetic field lines look like this. This whole intersection here is at about negative 1,000 volts, and the outer section is at zero. So when we pump down the chamber to a very low pressure and put our 1,000 volt potential difference on here, the remaining gas molecules in the chamber will ionize, uh, basically just like they do in a neon sign. And uh, the trick with the magnet is that it concentrates all of the electrons in this area. And it does this because the electrons are relatively lightweight and they have charge. So the uh, moving electrons are affected by these magnetic field lines. In fact, they actually spiral around the uh, magnetic field lines. So we con concentrated all the electrons in this area. However, it's not the electrons that are actually doing the sputtering for us. What happens is these spiraling, fast-moving electrons end up ionizing more gas molecules. And it's actually the gas molecules that are attracted to this negative potential and hit the surface and cause the sputtering to happen, which is why this is negative and the shield is, is relatively positive or at zero. Uh, this negative voltage attracts those positive gas molecule ions, and, and that's what causes the sputtering. The reason that we use argon is because we don't want any... So, for example, let's just kind of sputter the material in a process. Instead of sputtering, we just use pure argon. Uh, the exact pressure at which this whole process works is very critical to, to determining the success of your coating. So these are the equipments to conduct sputtering method. So if you have no gas molecules at really high levels up here, pressure is so that the income without, uh, you know, flowing everything. So if this is the device where we are going to process sputtering process. Yeah, basically. Another problem is that if you have tons of gas mm -hmm. molecules up here, when you eventually do sputter off a piece of the material, it's going to interact or it's going to hit those gas molecules. And that may or may not be a good thing depending on how your setup is, is configured. So if your surface to coat is kind of up here, uh, you generally want these these sputtered molecules to have a fairly clear path toward it. If there's so many gas molecules up here that a lot of the sputtered material interacts with the gas and kind of starts flowing, uh, that may be a bad thing because they're going to escape and, and coat other things on the surface of your chamber. 100 millitor um, to use the diffusion pump anyway and pump the chamber way down as low as the surface difficult and also, as the literature says, has a pretty profound effect on how the sputter process is going. I've been using an electrophoresis power supply for my first attempts here, and it turns out to be a very non-ideal power supply for this purpose. Uh, besides all the uh, stupid safety interlocks that are, make it difficult to use, the uh, supply goes into its current limit condition kind of too quickly, and it's hard to get a consistent voltage current out of it. Uh, it is nice that it has a constant power function, so you can actually set a desired wattage and then play with the chamber pressure and it will balance the voltage and current without exceeding that power limit. However, I think for future experiments, what I'm going to use is just a micro.
friends here we can see uh, thick film technology images so this is a thick film technology based uh, ic printed circuit board And here uh, we can compare uh, thick film and uh, thin film technologies. And few picks for uh, thin film uh, technology. One of the deposition techniques. All these images show, shows uh, different uh, technology. This image is showing a uh, film technology method by using ultrasonic vibrate, uh, ultrasonic uh, waves. So here, this device is used to Use in sensing of ultrasonic vibrations. So, different kinds of uh, thin film and thick film technology images uh, we have seen. Now, we'll go to the PPT and uh, we will see few more details about the MEMS again. <clears throat> so, as I inform you students, uh, in previous slides, uh, some information is lag. So, again, I am adding this information to the PPT. So, introduction about the MEMS. MEMS technology consists of microelectronic elements, actuators, sensors, and mechanical structures built onto the substrate. Microelectronic elements means resistors, capacitors, transistors, all these comes under uh, uh, electronic elements. Diodes, MOSFETs. Actuator means uh, it is a device which has solenoid rod which can move front and back by taking the input. Sensors, already we have discussed sensors and mechanical structures. Just now we have seen one demo video like a gear wheel we have implemented on the MEMS. Built onto the substrate. Substrate is the material which we are using to implement all these uh, devices which is usually silicon. They are developed using microfabrication techniques, deposition, patterning, and etching. The most common forms of production for MEMS are bulk micro machining, surface micro machining, and HR fabrication. The benefits of this small scale integration brings the technology to vast number and variety of devices. What is MEMS? Again, here I have included few images to understand the MEMS. The size of the MEMS should be 1 to 100 micrometers. Device vary from below 1 micron up to several mm. Functional elements are again uh, sensors and actuators, microelectronics. Components, these are the basic components which we will implement on the MEMS. Micro sensors, micro actuators, microelectronics, microstructures. 
all these are the elements uh, which we can implement on the maps go through this slide student microelectronics brain that receives process and makes decisions data comes from microsensors constantly gather data from environment pass data to microelectronics for processing can monitor mechanical thermal biological chemical readings microactuator acts as a trigger to activate a external device microelectronics will tell microactuators to activate device Microstructures, extremely small structures built onto surface of chip, built right into silicon nuts. So these are the devices which we can implement on the nuts. Fabrication process. Deposit thin film material anywhere between a few nanometers. 200 nanometers onto substrate substrate means mostly silicon and physical material placed onto substrate techniques include sputtering and evaporation these two already we have seen in demo video chemical stream of source gas reacts on substrate to grow product Technique included chemical vapor deposition and atomic layer deposition. The gear wheel demo video, which I have shown in this class. So there you have seen chemical is a, we we have to pour chemical on the sheet. Then it will take its position wherever is the necessary. Substrate silicon glass or quartz and thin film polysilicon silicon dioxide examples for our thin films. Patterning, transfer of pattern onto material after deposition in order to prepare for etching. Techniques include some type of lithography, photolithography is common. Students, do you have exam today? Hello? Students? Yes, sir. At what, at what time? 11.15. 11. Okay, students, I will uh, end class by ten thirty.
you can prepare for your examination etching wet etching dipping substrate onto chemical solution that selectively removes material process provides good selectivity etch rate of target material higher than mask material dry etching materials sputtered and dissolved from substrate with plasma or gas variations choosing a method desired shapes etch depth and uniformity surface roughness process compatibility safety cost availability environmental impact and here again we have our fabrication methods already we have discussed bulk by uh, micro machining uh, surface micro machining and this is the last slide of the module so this is the last slide to go through this slide friends for 2 minutes then i will uh, revise the entire module i will revise the entire module and i will show you two three videos to understand the sensors students so quickly we will revise the topics in our ppt so initially in the beginning of the module we have seen measurement system a system which can uh, estimate the physical parameters 
to process that uh, laboratory experiment or industrial applications we have to measure lot of physical parameters so it is a system which can measure parameters and this is the block diagram of the measurement system transducer it is a device which can uh, convert one form of energy to other form of energy sensor sensor is a device which can sense the variations in physical parameter and it will convert that uh, variation in physical parameter into other parameter but it, it will not be any energy form okay so it will undergo some changes in it that changes so we will uh, understand the variations in parameter actuator actuator is a device which can move its solenoid rod front and back or top to bottom transducer sensors and actuators uh, signal conditioning signal conditioning is the circuit which will receive signal from the transducer and uh, or sensor sensor and transducer output will not be suitable for the next process so signal conditioning will make, will receive that signal and it will process and it will make that signal as suitable for the next process and display display can be computer monitor or a tv or a print out or uh, just normal uh, device which can show numbers uh, value of the physical parameter that can also be a display system interface and data domains what are the different types of uh, data we have in the industries that we have classified here and sensors classification depending on the power supply output signal operation mode we have classified sensors static characteristics accuracy precision repeatability reproducibility linearity sensitivity all these are uh, static characteristics we have seen resolution threshold hysteresis also we have discussed after this uh, we have focused on the dynamic characteristics okay after that we have focused on the systematic errors errors we have classified into two types systematic errors and random errors systematic errors are the errors which we can uh, rectify and mostly because of the component damage and random errors we don't know the reason of the reason for the errors and to eliminate the impact of random errors on the calculation on the measurement so what we have to do we have to take average values after that we have focused on the dynamic characteristics so we have taken three types of systems zero order system first order system and second order systems and we have applied different types of inputs impulse input uh, ramp input sinusoidal input so when you apply those inputs we will get different outputs and for the second order system we have damping ratio depending on the damping ratio we will get a different output waveforms for the impulse input and here also we can see amplitude modulus and the phase modulus if you apply sine wave as input after focusing on the second order system first order system zero order system we have discussed uh, different types of sensors temperature sensor biometer is a sensor to estimate uh, temperature and next pressure sensors we have seen different types of uh, pressure sensors youtube youtube manometer and gordon tube diaphragms uh, bellows capsules so all these comes under the pressure sensors next we have focused on the flow meters orifice plates flow nozzle venturi meter all these comes under one type of uh, principle that is uh, differential pressure depending on the differential pressure uh, we have to estimate the flow rate in the pipe and later we have seen rotameter in this rotameter we have arranged a float depending on the flow rate float will take different positions in the rotameter and pitot tube pitot tube was a other type of uh, flow meter which use which is using pressure differences and lot of flow meters we have discussed and next for the level sensors we have used float if the float position is uh, by observing the float position we can estimate the liquid level in the tank and here lower figure shows that if you insert a gas into the liquid if you have if the liquid volume is more you can uh, experience more pressure to insert in a, to allow that flow to allow that flow in the 
liquid level. And force on torque sensors, cantilever beam, spring, and beam. Beam is for the measurement of torque. And here, if what to estimate the inclination, we have used the bubble device. And pendulum. If the base, if the floor is not flat, if it if it has inclination, pendulum will not make a ninety degrees with the floor, and bubble also will not be at the middle. And velocity sensors, gyroscope. I have shown you the demo. Next, micro sensors. Now, students, uh, I will show you some uh, videos to understand the working of the flow meters. Students, this is a normal pipe. Here you can see the shape of the pipe, and here we have introduced orifice plate. That is a plate which can reduce the cross sectional area of the pipe. Here is how this measurement method works. See, this is the actual obstruction. Differential pressure flow meters have an artificial restriction integrated into the measuring tube, illustrated here by the example of an orifice plate. So highlight one, highlighted one is the orifice plate. Two holes are located in the pipe wall. One. So here we have arranged new tube manometer. One is before the plate, another one is the after the plate, two Tubes. One before and one after the orifice plate. Two separate tubes connect these holes to a differential. So here to measure the differential pressure, we have arranged the diaphragm. Total pressure sensor with its two pressure chambers separated by a diaphragm. The tiniest pressure differences in the flowing fluid can be precisely measured. If the fluid is not flowing, the pressure before and after the orifice plate is essentially identical. So he allowed flow in the pipe. Now, as soon as the, the fluid yeah. starts to flow, its you. velocity arrives. So here, entire liquid, entire flow is occupying the entire pipe. But here, because of the alpha spread obstruction, this area of the pipe is not occupied by the liquid flow around the orifice plate increases significantly because of the restriction in the cross section. At the same time, due to the laws of fluid mechanics, the static pressure at this point decreases. So here, major liquid is stored and here we don't have any liquid. So here we can see more pressure because of the liquid has stored here because of the orifice plate, but here because of the orifice plate only, we are missing the liquid. Directly, liquid is touching pipe at this point, depending on the flow rate. Consequently, different values are detected in the pressure chambers of the sensor. A higher pressure before and a lower pressure after the orifice plate. 
This pressure difference is a direct measure for the flow velocity and thus the mass and volume flow in the pipe. The higher the flow velocity and the resulting drop in pressure around the orifice plate, the greater the differential pressure measured. In numerous industrial applications, the orifice plate covers many needs of flow measurement technology. However, other designs are available for certain measuring tasks to minimize undesired effects, such as excessive pressure loss or abrasion of components due to solids carried in the fluid. This demonstration shows that an abrupt restriction generates severe turbulence in a fluid. Nozzles with a rounded, funnel-like inlet clearly reduce turbulence and thus create less pressure loss. Nozzles are particularly suitable to higher flow velocities or to fluids with abrasive solid particles. Turbulence reduction is even greater with Venturi nozzles and finally with Venturi tubes where the restriction is created by longer conical constrictions in the pipe wall. All these designs can be supplied with different restriction diameter sizes so that the pressure loss and the differential pressure generated can be optimized for the process conditions. Industrial flow measurement using differential pressure has been tried and tested in numerous applications worldwide for about 100 years. With this measuring principle, all liquids, gases, or steam can be measured, even at extremely high process pressures and temperatures. Every differential pressure flow meter manufactured by Andrus and Hauser is configured to customers. So same principle we use in uh, r face plate, flow nozzle, and venture meters. Now I will show you demo for the rotameter. नमस्कार दोस्तों मैं प्रकाश कुमार सैनी दोस्तों प्रैक्टिकल गुरु चैनल में आपका सी स्टूडेंट्स हियर वी हैव रोटामीटर ए एंड रोटामीटर बी व्हेन यू आर अलोइंग फ्लो टू एनी वन ऑफ द रोटामीटर्स द फ्लोट विल टेक डिफरेंट पोजीशन सी बी इन रोटामीटर ए फ्लोट इज एट द इनिशियल पोजीशन and but uh, in the rotameter b float is rotating and it has taken different position in the meter now he is allowing flow in the rotameter a now a rotameter float is taking different position this is called variable area flow meter inlet is at the bottom outlet is uh, at the top for the rotameter and this is the valve to allow the liquid flow see when we are increasing flow rate float is taking different positions and students i will show you unit for the flow rate here you can see lph lph liters per hour if the float is at near the 100 flow rate is 100 liters per hour if float is at near the 40 the flow rate is 40 liters per hour Thank you. 
now flow rate is more than 80 liters per hour i think uh, 82 or 84 uh, liters per hour and this is the equipment to allow flow Okay, students, if you have any doubts in this model, you can ask. Otherwise, uh, within uh, five minutes, I will wind up the class. You can prepare for your examination. Up to 10.40, I have to conduct class. But you have exam, so I will uh, wind up a little bit uh, fast. Students, if you have any doubts, you can ask. Students, for a model examination, you have to prepare complete module. Thank you. 
Thank you. 